during the night time, uh, this area becomes a total slum. I mean, evils from all sorts crawl out. This area um, is actually at the moment it's in a state of anarchy, total anarchy. Seapoint has become gangland. Some gangsters now refer to this suburb as Mannenberg by the Sea. Gangsters and other criminal syndicates have moved into the area and made it their own. The Sea Point is sort of subdivided between the Americans, who consider a certain part of it their land as 26s, and the 20 and some of the HLs, of course, in alliance with it, and the 28s from the Altis River, who consider a large part of Sea Point as their land. Jeremy Veary is the former head of an investigative anti-gang task team. Uh, the 28s are further down, slightly past that shell grow the trees further down towards the Greenpoint area and the 26s from about that area. You have the Today he's the country's before, foremost the expert on Western Cape gangs. In the day this hardly looks like gangland, but behind this suburban facade a multiple murder took place. A murder that some say carries the hallmark of a gangland killing that took place under the cover of darkness. This is Sizzler's, a gay massage parlour at 7 Graham Street in Seapoint. It was famous for its collection of young men who were for sale for sex. But when police arrived here in the early hours of Monday morning a week ago, they found a bloodbath. Seven sex workers, a client and the brothel owner were dead. Their throats had been slit and they'd been shot execution style. What happened that night in Sizzlers has triggered a week of speculation, paranoia, fear and conspiracy theories. Tonight a special assignment team will attempt to bring you answers. Who committed these murders? Why were innocent young boys killed and what happened that night? Murders of this nature, not of this maybe this kind of scale of nature, but murders in general. gang related murders are normal. They are normal, they're not supposed to be normal, that's what I'm not condoning. But they are perfectly an average occurrence in some gang, in some, some, some gang areas in, in, in the northern suburbs in the part of this province. For me, there isn't anything that is new in this particular method, particularly in Cape Town. We've seen in the heart of the, the gang vigilante war, several people executed in this manner. Cape Town has become the gay capital of South Africa. Its streets are dotted and lined with gay clubs, massage parlors and male sex workers. Sizzlers was nothing exceptional, or was it? It was boys like this that adorned Sizzlers and attracted its clientele. A.B. Bush is an 18-year-old monsieur who started working at the club when he was only 17 years old. Sizzlers was known for young guys, you know, for good-looking young guys. And, you know, I was very young and, you know, very good-looking and... That's what, that's what they want. Well, I know about interviews, you have to, you got to strip for the owner. Um, you got to strip them totally naked for them, so they can see if you're well endowed enough, enough, I suppose, and how your muscular features are and everything before you do get the job. Well, it was mostly married men, uh, and they were just coming to have a great time, just to settle down. Yeah, you know, we were sitting and, you know, watching movies, gay movies, and we were having fun with the, with the owner, and, you know, the owner was a very nice guy. You go into the front door of the house, there's a security gate and a glass pane door. Um, as you walked in, there was a room on your left, and that's where all the guys slept and stayed and waited until clients came. Drugs were not allowed on the premises, but they allowed to do it outside. Money wasn't much because they used to have to pay 200 rand a week for being there. And the little cram room they were staying in that wasn't very nice looking. Um, the hours was long. If they stayed on the premises, even when they closed, they were on duty, they were on standby. They they supposed to do about five cli clients on average a day before they could, you know, go to sleep for, you know, to recover on the drug that they use or whatever. What happened was, the night I was there, they had 12, 
12 calls and two out bookings. Two where I delivered, cust uh, I delivered the youngsters to the gentlemen's houses where they went and did whatever they had to do. You had to sometimes wait for clients to arrive or maybe the clients doesn't want you because they've already had you and they just want to try somebody else or you never know, have to to see what the other people like. Nothing seems to have been out of the ordinary at Sizzlers, except for initial reports that suggested that the killers came to Sizzlers looking for two young men called Marawan and Stephen. Around the time of the murder, a group of unknown men allegedly also asked around town for Marawan and Stephen at gay clubs on the strip. I don't know why my name is Knut, but somebody must have used my name to do something wrong in Joburg, something very, very wrong, that 10 people get killed for it. Um, or this is just a decoy. Do you have enemies? Through the years, or two years that I've been there, I've had some threats from Nigerians, and Cape Black gangsters telling me, leave our boys alone. The, the other car that was seen, along with the white car, with the white men in, that were asking for you, the car behind was a red car. Who was in that car? Well, the, what I've gathered from the police, what I've heard them saying, it was two Nigerians. One with the name of CJ. Marawan denies allegations that they were involved in a massive drug deal and absconded without paying. The deal, it speculated, involved Nigerian drug lords and gangsters. Hours after the massacre, reports blamed the murders on four light-skinned men in a white BMW. But now another version is emerging. Street talk that has spread fast. In the car, we were on the road. What did they say? Who was in the car? So I think they were in the car. They were in the We needed a first-hand account of this new development on the identity of the killers. Up to this point, all speculation has centered around four white men. It took a special assignment team only a few hours to praise someone who lived in the area and said they'd seen the killers. The person was too terrified to speak on camera, but has made a statement to the police. The story they told us was the following. There were eight men driving two cars and the men weren't white. On the night of the murders, Juan Duval Ace made a phone call to Sizzlers. On the other side of the line, he says, he heard heavy breathing. Then the line went dead. Ace, who's also chairperson of the Gay and Lesbian Alliance, was one of the first to be on the scene and in the morgue to identify victims. Because of the fact that the guys were tied up, the way that the guy actually, all the guys was lined up, it, it seems to me that it actually appeared that there was like a praying, you know, in that position. And um, in the mortuary, actually, when I checked some of the guys where the tape actually was removed, some of the guys was, so the tape was already removed. And you could see actually the power that the guys tried to use to get rid of this tape while the execution uh, took place. So that's why I'm saying you can't believe and, and imagine the fear especially the guys that had to witness, that were still alive, had to witness to see that number one, number two, number three, number four got executed. I think it was pretty gruesome. I keep asking what it must have... Travis must have been terrified. Oof. Terrified. And that mm. is what's worrying me. He didn't go out peacefully. No. He went out a frightened little boy. These people were really slaughtered, you know, totally from ear to ear, right through. And, um, I mean, I checked small things, like um, on my friends and stuff, I could see some of the guys uh, still um, uh, was lying with, with, with uh, open eyes. I'm waking up at night, and I can see their throats, and I can see them so clearly. I mean, you wake up and you can see this face, and then I've got, got to go deal with this with Travis, all that blood all over his face. How could they try and help themselves when they were taped, gagged, made to lie on the floor? Uh, uh, apparently my friend was uh, uh, um, uh, trying to get, get away from the scene, right next to the window, behind one of the beds. And how to remove even that to get to him and kill him right there like an animal. And you know what, I can't even say like an animal because you don't kill animals like this at all. 
what murder, what murder is that? What murder do you call that? Sizzler's owner, Aubrey Otgar, known as Eric, was the first to be laid to rest. To his family and some of the boys in his parlour, he was a loving and caring man. Others, though, accuse him of exploiting desperate young boys. The first thing that I would say to you to do today is that because what we do does not define who we are, what we see in the life of Aubrey, in my life, in your life, is never God's final word about any person. Never. If there was one person who was in the same lifestyle that Aubrey found himself in and his eight companions, just one single person who looked at the horror of this event and stopped for a moment and considered things carefully and decided to get out, to make a break, to make a change, just one person, then the death of Aubrey and Travis and Sergio and their companions would be exactly the same as the death of Jesus on the cross. When I was there, there were, there were threats and what could have happened there, I don't know. But uh, the, the phone sometimes rings in the morning and when you pick it up, you know, there's no answer. As the massacre in Seapoint reverberated across the country, parents, friends and family identified their loved ones. In the free state town of Tunison, 17-year-old Farnes Fushir was buried. He was known as Ryan and had gone to Cape Town to find his luck. Yesterday his parents buried their only child. Ryan was also 17 and we just said that we were 18 or 19 just to get into the job because we, uh, we, we find it difficult to get a job or to do anything because we needed money to, you know. He also wanted to finish school, that's on the stage he told me, because he's only at standard eight. The brutality of these murders has shocked and baffled policemen, journalists and family members. Why would the killers slit throats and then shoot people at point-blank range. What would the significance of this be in a gangland killing? The Sizzler's murders were brutal to the extreme. Who is capable of such a deed and why? The firstly one, I don't want to speculate about the murder itself. I'm not, I don't have access to the, to the, to the, to the evidence. I think one of the, the, the telling signs that we should try and look into, what there are aspects we should look at is, is the, the way they were killed, the slaughtering way. I think the solution to finding out where these killers were is for the authorities to go and look at the methodology that was employed here. What is interesting to me, what, what, what would assist a more accurate reflection on the issue, is to actually look at how it was done. Because the pattern would seem to suggest that it follows the patterns uh, of earlier killings in, in Cape Town. And how it was done is cannot simply be explained in terms of when shooting, slow throat and what I want to see, how throats were slit. Which way were they facing when this happened? Uh, what was said while it was being done. Massacres like these have happened before in Cape Town and are not new in the Western Cape. For example, this is a 1998 execution of six suspected drug dealers in a house in Woodstock, Cape Town. One of the victims was gang leader Pinocchio. Four men entered his house late at night and shot them at point-blank range. It's, it's a not an uncommon phenomenon, and you know, welcome to Cape Town, welcome to Johannesburg. This is this is South Africa. We, we must wake up to that reality. Since the middle 90s, gangsters expanded their base from the traditional strongholds of the Cape Flats. They moved into the lucrative area of Cape Town's inner city, specifically Sea Point. Different areas of Sea Point are now controlled by the so-called 26 and 28 gangs. Both are involved in prostitution. Both are involved in the sale of coke at the street level. Uh, 
And that essentially is their business here. Different gangs control different turf. Whoever controls the land picks the fruit of the underworld. To the gangs, everything in that area belongs to them. In gang logic, any business operating in their turf does so on gang terms. You have no right to conduct a business which they consider their activity in their land. As you hear the term and the term, listen to what they use to describe you. A fool, a pater, a dirty, stupid person. In literal terms, you have no right as someone foreign to the camp to conduct that type of type of activity in your, or any kind of illicit business activity in the particular land. But what's going on in Seapoint? What lies behind the facade of restaurants, hotels, and multi-million rand real estate? We asked a former narcotics bureau officer to take us on a journey through Seapoint at night. Abram Smith is now a private security consultant and knows the area well. This area is actually at the moment it's in a state of anarchy, total anarchy. It's, it's gone to waste. The criminals are in charge. Uh, a sea point has become a springboard for organized crime. I think as we as we progress through the night, um, the footage will speak for itself and uh, one could actually then exploit and see what actually happens in the underworld in this side of, of uh, Cape Town. On the left we have two prostitutes, two locals. A lot of these uh, women are under restraint and controlled by local gang groups um, and pimps. And of course, varies from street block to street block. If the 28s, I know they have a gay prostitution network. They have both sides of the prostitute, prostitution. But you must understand within the 28s, not all of, uh, let's not, they hate the word gay and they hate being referred to as, as, as homosexual in some cases. There's, there's no visibility of policing in this area. Um, there's tremendous congregation of, of, of smaller groups. Um, drug trafficking is rife. You'll be approached. You look, look, video this guy. Just, just, just approaching a video him. Is it really good? Uh, what you got? It depends on the type you want. Huh? All right, I'm gonna go around the block. Huh? Okay. okay. What you got? H. Yeah. All right. Man. Yeah. Uh, you think, uh, you're, you're something, huh? yeah, but you're waiting now. We, wanna, we, must, we, must go by the yeah, we go by the side, huh? As you could see, you approach by a West African. You can catch him, catch his face. A West African that actually offered me openly whatever I want. Cocaine, crack. There's a lot of talk about the Nigerians in Seapoint. And uh, so they supply drugs to, to, they supply coke to the, to, to the Americans and they supply coke to, to the 28s here in this particular area. The same people, expediently so. It is understood, it is done. What you got? Okay, now go, 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 go. Okay, okay. Just go, just go. Right force, right force. That's how they rob you. They'll jump in here, they'll knife you. The problem with the Nigerians is they don't have the muscle. Whoever has tried to operate here, they were forced into a position where they should recognize the authority of the hard livings in the Sea Point area at the time, where they should recognize the authority of the Americans. To the extent, some of them where they did not were chased out of town. And they ran out of town. There was a stage that the Nigerians, well, the West Africans, had a mood of a shootout with the gangsters here. They don't retrieve, eh? They don't stand back. Look, the 28s live in the city. They live at certain, uh, I know some of them lived at, lived at certain backpackers and some of them lived in some hotels down here. 
a lot of the, the, the criminal groups operating in this area are, have actually invested in purchasing uh, property um, in this area. Let's go past the crime scene. Just go very slow. I think it, it, it was definitely um, related to um, the actual extor extortion racketeering that, that came on in, the, in, in, in this province and of which uh, this area has fallen prey um, and is actually the victim of, of, of such a, um, a barbaric act. You must understand, brutal brutality and those things are terms that mean certain things in our non-gang terms. Down there these things are business as usual. If for a ritual reason something has to be executed to correct some particular wrong or goes a fail and Pata is doing the work of the number that he shouldn't be doing, it gets done as part of a normal complying with the code of conduct or enforcing that compliance with the code of conduct or ensuring that that person desists from that practice. That in that type of reasoning, their reasoning, their frame of reference is normal. A lot of times people describe killings as senseless. You know, when when uh, so many people die in one in one event, one incident. I think, on the contrary, to the killers and to the people that have ordered this killing, it makes perfect sense. I don't want to say this is the case here, but the slaughtering would be well, part of, in some cases, 28 ritual. But under particular circumstances, when you want to make a point, a statement about something. You see, 28s don't shoot at random. They don't just kill randomly. They kill in a particular way to project a certain message. Not to you, who don't understand it, but to the camp, whoever they want that message to go out to. This is a 28 massacre, a bloodbath that is similar to what happened in Sizzlers just over a week ago. In this massacre in Esterafir two years ago, three people were mowed down. Police subsequently blamed the 28s for the bloodbath. If I, if I said 28, for example, if I reason according to the way they reason, I needed to make an example of a failed Mpata who's operating a business within my land as the 28, to which he has no right to do. He's earning income with money that is rightfully mine as a 28. I need to send a message to everybody that this should not be done again. And why I send this message is through slaughter. I, I will slaughter them, if, if, if I should reason in those terms. As yet, the police have not officially blamed the Seapoint massacre on gangs operating in the area. But Sizzlers was in 28's territory. We don't know if the owner paid protection money or whether he or anyone linked to the parlor was involved in drugs or any other illicit deals. But if he had angered the gang or was branded as a foe Limpata, Sizzlers could have expected a visit from the gangs. <laughs>